When your granny dies in the way mine did, nobody knows what to do with you. Everybody knows you were there when it happened. Everybody knows you had some involvement in it. But nobody specifically says it's your fault. After an event like that, you're pretty much left on your own. Your granddad's been arrested and taken away for questioning. The guards are over at your house asking shit loads of questions. Your dad, who's useless up to this point, just becomes a big pile of fucking nothing. And your mum, a mother of 29 of two kids, who was sullen and distant for as long as you can remember, ends up drinking every day. Everybody tells you during a time like this that you have to be strong. Now I know what they mean by that. They mean don't show weakness. But you can't just fucking tell somebody to be strong and expect them to be that. How can you expect somebody to be strong when the only strong person they've seen was killed with three swift punches to the face? So, at the age of 13, I was left with all the time in the world and all the freedom to do whatever the fuck I pleased, whether I liked it or not. Funnily enough, during this time, I used to go to school every day. I mean, my friends were there. The teachers pretty much fucking left me alone after knowing what the fuck had happened. Also, the concentration needed when using a lathe in metalwork or using the furnace was a great source of distraction. I actually made two pokers and a coat hanger during this time and I still have them to this day. But it was in the afternoons and evenings that the darkness came. My dad was out drinking every evening. My mum, while trying to maintain a sense of calm and continuity, made sure that she had the dinner on the table every time we came back from school. But she thought she had her job done and as soon as she did so, would settle in for the night with an agon of vodka while watching neighbours. I had the rest of the evening all to myself. I started by going out on my BMX, fucking around, doing skids. Sometimes I'd go to football training and meet up with a few of the lads afterwards and go down to Finiston and fling fucking stones at the windows of the empty office blocks that were closed for the evening. But that only lasted so long. After a while, Mothers started clamping down on their son's nighttime adventures. And after a week or two, I was left to my own devices. I used to sneak into the race course. I loved running around the eerily open space track. I'd stand underneath the main stand and look out over Sligo town and the lights flickering at nighttime in the distance. Made it look like it was a little toy town. I used to love the fact that you couldn't see the details of the people or the cars moving about. It made me think I was in control. I'd rest on that thought for a little bit and then fuck off and get back to gallivanting. Then I'd go into the graveyard next door and pretend that there were zombies coming out of the graves trying to eat me brains. I'd do as much as I could to harness as much adrenaline as I possibly could at this stage. I also used to love cycling down deadly dark country roads, pretending that somebody was trying to grab me and do untold horrors to me. One Thursday night, after doing laps of Sligo, I decided to head into town. I wasn't feeling the usual nighttime excitement. I'd already cycled up and down Pierce Road about four times. Anyway, walking around town, I noticed that the pubs and the streets were heaving with people. Everybody seemed to be about 19 or 20. Outside the Solstice nightclub, lads were standing there with their shirts open to the third button, sweat pouring off them. A gaggle of girls sat on the curb in groups of twos and threes. These were obviously students from the RTC or Sligo's Technical College. Anyway, I made my way down O'Connell Street, turned onto Wine Street, I went as far as the Claret Hotel, where there were more people stood outside. But these were different. They were all dressed as if it was the 1970s. 
big flared jeans that were fraying at the bottoms. Elaborately coloured tie-dye t-shirts. Some of the girls wore chunky fleece-lined suede coats and Jesus, even the lads had black makeup under their eyes and big baggy paisley shirts on their backs. A couple of the fourth and fifth years dressed like this at school, but I had never seen this many elaborately dressed people in one place in all my life. They were dressed to impress, but not in the usual way. Not like the way my mum and dad used to dress when they'd go out. My dad used to love wearing black slip-on shoes, black jeans, a white shirt, and a tin red leather tie, and if it was cold, a black leather jacket. His curly hair and moustache were always fucking perfect. Me mam, when she'd go out, would wear big long flowy dresses and spend the whole afternoon at the hairdressers perming her hair to perfection in anticipation of Laguna Azul nightclub. But these were different. Their sense of self, everything, just couldn't take my eyes off them. While I was looking at them, John Smelly Kelly, this scrawny knacker of a third year, walked by and shouted in the direction of about six of them, Fucking hippies! One of the hippies, who had long blonde dreadlocks and was wearing a blue Adidas tracksuit top, put his hand over his heart in mock hurt and said, Oh, how the witticisms of a well-constructed insult doth do pain inflict. Now, I'd never heard anyone talking like this except teachers. And to be honest, I thought they were fucking knobs for doing so. But the people in this group didn't think dreadlocks was a knob. They thought he was fucking hilarious. And they kept laughing and laughing at this joke. Until eventually, the insult was forgotten and they got back to talking amongst themselves. After a couple of minutes, they started getting a little bit more secretive and started to huddle together. Couldn't fucking see what was happening, but it was clear that the dreadlock wordsmith seemed to be the man in charge, as everybody was deferring to him. Fucking drove me mad that I couldn't see what they were doing. So, in a fit of frustration, I zoomed over my bike and did one of my trademark skids in front of them gave them the fucking shock of their lives. They all looked at me with alarm in their eyes and as soon as they realised I was a 13 year old boy, their faces turned from fear to consternation. And I could see that they were carrying small little bags of plastic with two or three white tablets in them. Dreadlocks looked at me and screamed, what the fuck? For a split second, I didn't know what to do. I was about to turn in my heel and zoom away on my bike when all of a sudden I blurted out, All right, sirs, evening, madams, doffing me imaginary cap in their direction as I did so. Nice night for a spot of blow. Now, I ain't a fucking clue what blow was at this stage, but it seemed like the right thing to say. Anyway, a couple of them chuckled and one of them said to me, Little fucking shite. To which I replied, Don't worry about me. You get back to doing what you're doing. I'll keep an eye out for the pigs. Go on to fuck, snarled Dreadlocks. Get the fuck out of here. But I didn't move. I stood my ground. I wanted a thrill, and standing up to a Sligo drug dealer seemed like the best way to get it. Anyway, after a minute or two, Dreadlocks got back to his dealing. I could see he felt uncomfortable with me though, staring at him. So, as I had said I'd look out for the guards, I turned my head away to see if anybody was coming in their direction. Dreadlocks finished with the group that he was with and fucked off to another one. And that was when I saw her for the first time. She had long straight red hair that flowed down either side of her face. Stunning brown eyes dark olive skin. She was as exotic as she was Irish. She wore beaded necklaces that highlighted her beautiful long neck. She wore a long tight purple skirt that contrasted with the green vest top that she was wearing that was embroidered with images of suns and moons. Her fingers glistened with beautiful silver rings of 
curious forms and shapes. I felt a tingle in my belly and all of a sudden felt a bit queasy. Dreadlock seemed to be just as engrossed in her as I was, as we were spending all his time talking to her. He whispered something in her ear and she turned her head and looked towards me. Embarrassed, I turned my head away and looked towards the other direction, down towards O'Connell Street. As I did so, I saw a white patrol car with its siren turned off making its way towards us. Now, I don't know how I knew to do this, but I calmly and slowly walked up to Dreadlocks, whispered in his ear, Hey, the guards are coming. Dreadlocks looked down the road and said to everybody, All right, lads, must be making tracks. I'll see you all inside. Red looked at me, gave me a lovely warm smile, turned around and walked towards the door of the claret. As I was cycling back up Castle Street, on my way home, I heard a whistle. <whistles> hey, little fucker. Thanks for that. Listen, how would you like to earn a few quid? That's how I became a drug dealer's assistant, fell in love, and set myself up for the biggest fall of all.